dealing specifically with Grettir's case as an outlaw. So the title of my paper is Molding One Another, Grettir and the Landscape. The Island Dinga Sagar have long been praised for the sense of realism that they evoke, particularly when compared to other genres of medieval literature. This sense of realism is aided in part by the fact the majority of the action in the Island Dinga Sagar take place in Iceland itself. The fact that the setting for many of these sagas can be visited led audiences of the saga for a long time to view the landscape in which the stories unfold as nothing more than a backdrop into, onto which these tales were projected. In recent years, scholars have begun to point out that the landscape in the sagas is not always uh, a static setting, but can in fact take on narrative role in the plot. One of the sagas most vivid uh, one of the sagas to most vividly illustrate the importance of landscape to both its plot and its characters is Grettis Saga Asmundarsanar. Grettis Saga has often been identified as a tale of survival, or as a narrative of the old clashing with the new, but it is just as much a story about transformation. <clears throat> this saga notes how Grettir manipulates the landscape around him. Grettir's actions alter the land physically, and the text names and identifies the land through narrative action. However, these changes go both ways, with Grettir himself also being transformed by his experiences within the landscape. Over time, Grettir is desocialized, and he increasingly becomes an aspect of the external, natural environment. Grettir impacts the world around him, and through his struggles beyond the social sphere, we see how the landscape changes Grettir in turn. Scholars are... Uh, um, Scholars early on used the landscape descriptions from the sagas when trying to identify the actual places in Iceland where particular <coughs> events took place. However, close inspections and comparison of the descriptions of a particular landscape at multiple points, e uh, even within a single text, can at times make it difficult to reconcile the geography of the saga with that of the physical world. Ian Wyatt points out the description for the farm Holt uh, and Seibold uh, in chapter 5 and 16 of Gisla Saga Sursanar. The former describes the relative position of the farms, but makes no mention of the stream that Gisli later uses to hide, uh, to hide his tracks, while the latter places a stream between the farms without expanding on its, uh, the positions of the farms themselves. While this may make the geography of these farms seem problematic, Wyatt points out that the literary reading of the saga's geography need not be bound by Iceland's actual physical features. The stream in question serves the narrative action of the text, and that is enough. Grettir's saga, which covers a wider geographic range than the Skisla saga, pushes the narrative function of the landscape further. An early example of, uh, from Grettir's saga, in which the landscape serves an unambiguously narrative function, can be found in the scene when Grettir fights a bear in Norway. Some men go out to hunt a bear uh, that has been causing trouble one winter. When they find its lair, the saga provides a clear description of the site, and I will be subjecting you to some crude translations of Old Icelandic, so just bear with me. They found, uh, they found it in the sea crags. There was one crag and a jutting cave on the front of the crag, but a narrow path to walk up, uh, up, to, walk up to it. There was a precipice under the cave and a heap of stones against the sea. There was certain depth to whichever fell from above." End quote. This description of the landscape at the bear's lair sets the arena where Grettir and the bear would eventually meet in combat. The lethality of, the fall, uh, of a fall from the cliff foreshadows the ending of Grettir's fight when both he and the bear would fall, when, uh, with Grettir landing on top. Whether or not this cave by the cliff has any direct correlation to the geography of Norway is unimportant. As a narrative function, it helps Grettir slay a bear and makes his reputation grow. For the remainder of this paper, I will explore the relationship of Grettir as a character uh, to the landscape that he encounters. The first time that Grettir is changed by the landscape he faces, he is in Norway and not Iceland. Grettir is often described as having had all of the qualities that would make a man great during the heroic age, but living just after it. This is made explicitly clear during his escapade in the burial mound of Kaur and Gamle. While walking one evening, Grettir, quote, saw a great fire burst up on, a, on this headland, which was down from Eidun's far, unquote. Merrill Cla uh, Kaplan describes a typological way in which the chronology of the world of the sagas can be viewed. 
While the division she adapts is threefold, only two are of importance in this sense. The pre-conversion past and the post-conversion pre uh, present that Greti lives in. The fire that Greti sees is an eruption, an interpolation of the heroic pagan past onto Greti's own Christian time. This eruption piques Greti's interest, and he finds himself unable to resist its lure. It is by way of the landscape that Greti is made to come face to face with the heroic past that he seems so much better suited to. While Greti breaks into the mound of Karun Gandli, he is crossing between worlds. The mound that he had spotted at a distance now serves as a literary gateway into the heroic pre-conversion past. Although Karu's son, Thorvinur, is still alive when Grete breaks into the mound, the nickname in Ganle, meaning the old, associates Karu with the past. We must remember that the conversion to Christianity in Iceland is still a recent event when the barrel breaking takes place. Karu's uh, barrel, uh, barrel provides the liminal space for Grete to develop into a great heroic figure. He not only wrestles with the figure of the heroic past, he defeats him. More important, uh, more important still is what Grete takes with him from the mound, both figuratively and literally, Karl's short sword. Quote, so good a weapon that he said he had never seen one better, end quote. This short sword becomes Grete's iconic weapon of choice, a temporarily displaced artifact that Grete acquires in the land beyond the social sphere. What makes Grete's interaction with the landscape so striking is the fact that he is not simply passively changed by it. In many ways, Grettir can be seen to change the landscape of Iceland in return. If we think of the landscape as our uh, perception and reception of the physical topography, then Grettir's impact on it seems quite significant, even by just judging the number of place names that the saga attributes to Grettir's involvement. Part of uh, Grettir's issue fitting into society is the fact that he constantly wishes to test his might, and society presents him with few opportunities to do so. By contrast, the physical world beyond the social sphere is full of challenges. <clears throat> Even the landscape itself provides Greta several opportunities to test himself. The first instance in which Greta tests himself against the landscape is when riding to the Althingi before he was ever outlawed. The saga says that Greta lifted up the stone that lay on the grass, and that stone is now called Greta's Hav, that is Greta's Lift. Prior to Greta's interaction with the stone, there seems to have been nothing special about it. We can imply it was a large stone, but there are plenty of large stones throughout Iceland. By having it associated with his own strength, Grettir bestows a new meaning on this specific aspect of the landscape. Another great stone by the same name appears in the saga after Grettir returns to Iceland. Grettir uh, attempts to lift this one while being pursued until his enemies ultimately arrive and a battle broke out. This stone bearing Grettir's name not only provides a narrative function of facilitating a violent encounter, it also serves to commemorate the side of the battle within the saga, of, of, within the world of the saga. Returning to the external world's influence over Grettir, if his fight with Karun Gamli is what first sets him on course at odds with the social world, his fight with Glamour is what cements it. Before their encounter, a connection is established between Glamour and the landscape. Elnor Baraklau points out that from the moment uh, Glamour's corpse is found in the valley, <coughs> the narrative associates him with the treacherous cliffs above the, uh, the lower settlements. The evil forces that Glamour was supposed to expel can be measured by traces it leaves in the landscape, such as its enormous tracks, a trait it shares with Grettir himself, who often alter the landscape around him. Following his transformation after death, Glamour inherits this link to the world of the outside, and it forms part of his identity during his battle with Grettir. The fight between Grettir and Glamour begins inside a hall. William Sayer describes the hall as a social and cultural microcosm. It is the epitome of the social world, and the fight between Grettir and Glamour largely centers on a former trying to drag the latter outside of his social haven. The, inter uh, the interior of the hall causes its physical dimension, uh, because of its physical dimensions, restricts the movement of Grettir's enormous assailant, giving Grettir an advantage while fighting indoors. Nevertheless, it is not until the fight is taken outside of the hall that Grettir is able to gain victory. In their fight, Grettir and Glamour bring the hall crashing down, symbolically damaging Grettir's connection to the social sphere from then on. 
This, trans uh, this transition is made more explicit by Glamour's words to Gretel when he is defeated. Quote, you will, be made, uh, you will be made to become an outlaw and to suffer to live outside alone. End quote. With this statement and the curse that he lays on him, Glamour declares Gretel a man of the outside world and sentences him to arrive in the Icelandic landscape. Gretel's transformation into a man of the landscape is first clearly depicted during his stay at Fagraskogafjall. And get used to me uh, trying to pronounce that word. Gretel's mountain hideout is on the outskirts of society. He is placed far enough to be distinct from society, but close enough that he still interacts with it. A hole on the mountain allows Gretel to see what happens below while keeping himself hidden. Helen Damico describes Fagraskogafjall as an idyllic space within the world of Gretel's saga. Gretel's mountain hideout serves him as an efficient fortress while he dwells there. It is easily defensible and provides a good vantage point. Gretel literally inhabits the hole in the mountain, seamlessly feeling its gap. Pushed, onto the world out, uh, pushed into the world outside, Gretel begins to adapt to the landscape in a way that he never could adapt to the social sphere. Gretel's interactions with other people at this point in the narrative also illuminate how he has changed into a being of the outside. For the first time in her narrative, Gretel, the man who sought out Karun Ganle, the bear that was causing trouble in Norway, and Glamour is being sought out by another. He's clearly transitioning from someone who seeks out and settles disturbances from the outside associated with particular landscape features, whether a burial mound, uh, a cave by the cliffs, or the hills above a valley, to someone who now himself uh, is a disturbance from the outside associated with particular landscape features. At this point in Gretel's transformation, the mountain Fagraskogafjall. Just as the external world's influence of a Gretel is gradual, Gretel's own impact on the landscape is not always immediate or intentional. In an encounter with his enemy Thorbjörn, Gretel throws a spear which loses its head in midair. Because they were fighting over marshland, the spear was not found during Gretel's lifetime. The saga says, that spear which Gretel had lost was not found before the times that are remembered by those which live now. That spear was found during the latter days of Sturla Thorsterson, the lawman, and in the marshland where Thorbjörn fell, and now is called Spiltmir, Spear Marshland. Uh, end quote. The saga narrator says that the finding of the spear is taken as proof that this is where Thorbjörn died, despite conflicting reports claiming that he died elsewhere. Again, we see how Gretel's interaction with the landscape give a particular meaning that it would otherwise go without. The saga author is able to claim Gretel's own deeds as evidence for his tale, while simultaneously connecting him with the significant Sturla uh, Thorsterson and the world of saga's audience. Because of how much time Gretel spends in the landscape and his status as a cultural icon, the saga author can continuously tie the physical evidence to chapters of Gretel's life. The saga identif uh, identifies the remains of a hut at Arnabat Heilir, still visible at the time of the saga's composition, as the work of Grettir. While Grettir is, was not the only Icelandic outlaw to make a hut for himself, as we heard earlier today, uh, the saga treats Grettir's case as noteworthy, nonetheless. References are made to features in the landscape that were presumably recognizable to the saga's <coughs> original audience, whether they were the work of a historical Grettir or not. What's important is not how the physical landscape matches up to any historically accurate action, but rather the fact that Gretir, the Gretir of the saga manipulated the landscape around him so much that one expects to find traces of it still to the time of the saga's composition. Gretir's force, physically and narratively, was such that he could forever alter people's perception of the land around them that he'd come into contact with. As I mentioned earlier, many of Gretir's interactions with the landscape when not motivated by survival were the result of tests of strength. We must remember that Gretir's saga is not only concerned with Gretir's symbolic impact on the world of the saga's audience, but it takes an interest in the ways in which Gretir physically alters the landscape that he himself inhabits. While staying with Björt, the chieftain with influence in the region where the mountain Fagraskogafat is located, the saga tells of how Gretir and his host placed stepping stones on a river, quote, which have never since been driven off, end quote. The saga mentions that neither the swelling of the river nor its freezing over were able to move these stones that Gretir and Björn had placed in the river. 
In this way, Gretzit can be seen as producing permanent changes on the landscape, much as it produces on him. And while this deed is attributed to Gretzit and Björn together, Gretzit's saga makes a point to mention that most people believe Gretzit was the stronger of the two, despite what any other saga might tell you. Despite its critical placement in Gretzit's development beyond the social realm, Gretzit is eventually forced to leave Padraskova Fiat. Sometime after leaving his mountain, Gretzit finds himself once again being pursued and stopped by the farm of Kutmundur and Rikke to ask for help, and is pointed to the ultimate outlaw's retreat, the island Dranke. He reaches Dranke on the advice of Gutmundur who tells him, quote, that island lies in, Ska uh, in Skagafjörður, which is called Dranke. It is such a good stronghold that no one can come up it unless they use a ladder, end quote. Once again, Gretil inhabits a landscape that mirrors his position in, well, I'm sorry, that mirrors his position in, or rather outside society. An island is the final great analogy to Gretil's life, and the place where that life finally ends. For Gretir, Dange represents an illusion of safety. It forms a part of the landscape just outside of society and promises a degree of comfort. However, just as the island, the island is still within side of society, so too is Gretir still subject to the social world. More than any other place in the saga, Dange symbolizes the outlaw. Gretir takes Dange for a remote stronghold that can be easily defended from outsiders, but neither he nor the island are really ever beyond reach. Though Gretzir's affinity with the landscape and natural world grows stronger throughout the saga, it is not until he reaches Drangi that it all comes together. Like the island, Gretzir lives alone and, uh, and to the side, but still within reach. At Drangi, tru uh, at Drangi, Gretzir truly becomes one with his environment, and so it is no wonder that he refuses to ever leave, even when his life is threatened. Gretzir's landscape associated falls all met their demise in the cold. The undead Kaur and Glamour were faced around Yule, just like the trolls that he fights uh, in chapter 65 and 66 of Gretzir's saga. And the bear that he fights in Norway was awoken during winter. The coming of Gretzir's end is foretold in a, similar, uh, in a similar nature to that of the creatures he once defeated. It is in the late autumn, it is in late autumn and under cover of darkness that one thing which ironically frightens the mighty warrior that Gretir is finally attacked on Drangir. Once banished to the outside, Gretir embodies more and more of the traits of his former external foes until their narrative becomes his own. Drange is a reflection of what Gretir becomes. Uh, given what a misfit Gretir was in society, and given how much of his life was spent in the physical terrain beyond social boundaries, it is only to be expected that Gretir would himself become a sort of island. Gretir was more a part of Drange than he, was, than he ever was a part of society, just like Glaumur was a part of the valley, the bear a part of the cliffs, and the trolls part of the, the cavern. Gretir's interaction with the landscape as described in Gretir's saga are twofold. While he never seems quite fit for, for the social world, his brushes with the world beyond do not leave Gretir unchanged. Each encounter that Gretir has with the creatures of the, uh, of the periphery lure him further out of society, and the longer he spends in the landscape, the more Gretir resembles it. Likewise, the longer Gretir is out in the landscape, the more that he changes it in turn. Throughout his feats, Gretir, Gretir transforms Iceland's surface and through, the, uh, and through the introduced place names, its identity. Gretir's impact on the landscape ranged from reshaping the world of the saga to changing the reception of the landscape in present-day Iceland, present day, uh, both to our own day and to the saga's composition. Though both are thoroughly transformed by the end, ultimately, it is difficult to say which of the two played a bigger role in molding the other, Gretir or the landscape. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, who would like to start with questions or comments for Eduardo? We were on a great year theme already in our last discussion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I had some common question like mixed together, but I, I think like you're really, really right to stress like that it's kind of uniqueness on the way it influences the landscape because, for example, thinking about the posterity like nowadays how Gretir is seen in Iceland, I've noticed that uh, what you mentioned the Gretis lift, mm -hmm. like there are like names with Gretir about stones like this all over Iceland. Even Gretir never went there. Like there's even one on Vesman Island. 
and it's called the Galaxy Sleep. That's what it is. It's a huge rock. And I was thinking, like, if, are there any other characters that have this impact? Like, for example, Galaxy is quoted in or mentioned in a lot of sagas, but Nyalt is is not in that right. sense. And the place names are only in the region where the saga happened. So. I wonder, like, how unique is that, and if you know their examples of it, or is it it's only Gretia with such, you know, all over the place. Gretia is the one who I think, uh, I, I think at some point, uh, leading up probably up to the 14th century, he became a cultural icon, and mm -hmm. Gretia Saga itself makes references to potentially an earlier form of the text, and to several poems that deal with Gretia and his travels around, like, um, I can't remember the original name, but one of them is translated as Hending Gretia around, and I think that because of this position that he held in the cultural imagination, more and more things were attributed to him until Gretzil became an important symbol of Icelandic identity itself. Mm. He almost becomes a sort of foundation myth, doesn't he? Like, I've seen several of those for regions in, in Norway and Denmark. Well, this is King Sogni of Sognefjord, and this is his grave mound, and so, so on. That regions seem to have this character that somehow is the landscape, yeah? I wanted to ask you actually about this island that Grettir comes to when he first comes to Norway and mm -hmm. um, where he defeats the Haugui Karin Gamli and I seem to remember he sailed through fog <coughs> then got to the island and that or was that just in a translation I read? Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to remember now. Um, yeah. I know that he he's alerted by this flare that he sees. That may ha he may have yeah. noticed that through fog. But, but before he even arrives in the island, uh, he sails he... through fog and then he comes down. That fog is set off alarm bells in my head, saying, "Is this even a real island, or is <laughs> something that Gretir is just telling stories about?" Because while he's on the island, he is the man he wants to be. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a hero who fights uh, uh, Haugui, he gets away with his precious sword. He's, a, he's the hero that's celebrated by the family, single family living on there. He uh, overcomes two berserkers through kind of ingenious trick. Uh, and he leaves there with, with fame and fortune. That is where he is the great he wants to be. Right. And then with the fog added to that, I thought, Hmm, is this a kind of fantasy <laughs> island for him or what? He, he needed to somehow end up heroically stranded somewhere so he could force that identity that he wanted. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, to, to just draw this uh, island connection, I think this is really true that uh, the island as a, as, a, as a space had a strong connection with uh, outlaw characters mm -hmm. as, as Gretir. And uh, I think it, it's really shown even in other sagas, not only Gretis saga, that islands are always connected with fugitives or unstable power or something, you know, threatening mm -hmm. uh, in that sense. So I think the landscape and the character merge there. I'm, I'm thinking about Gisla saga, for example, when, you know, he has this curse on him, but, oh, we forgot the, to mention the <laughs> islands there. So it means he would find shelter on an island for a while. So it means the islands are, in their mind at least, like, separated space where, you know, things like that can happen and it's the same I thought about Okneinga saga, mm -hmm. the kind of mythological beginning with the two brothers, yeah. one set on Norway and the other become sea kings from the island that will always attack the mainland and <laughs> it connects uh, like with the session we had earlier about islands being these places of unstable power of, of threats and I think it's a big association in the in all the Icelandic world you are this literary corpus and I think Gretia is one example of this but it goes even beyond, like uh, in all the corpus. I think we could even find more examples. Yeah, that could be really interesting, actually. Aha, plan for the future. <laughs> now, our next speaker is Roderick uh, MacDonald, and he's also doing uh, medieval Icelandic studies, but he's in the University of Iceland. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I think, um, I know this session is subtitled Surviving in the Landscape. I think my paper is more about where is the landscape. Um, 